Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mount Athos and Aquinas Fellowship. In this episode, I'll be comparing and contrasting Maximus's three tier of being with Aquinas's three tier of participating light. As we shall soon see, both of these great minds encompass all of their theology within a hierarchical paradigm. We'll also touch briefly upon the aeons and the avum as formulated by Maximus and Aquinas, since understanding these places are important to understanding the hierarchy of elevation as posited by each. Let's begin. Throughout the corpus of Maximus's work is an underlying theme of what is called by many the triad of being. This triad consists of being, well-being, and eternal well-being as hierarchically ordered. It's also important to note that against those who hold to apocatastasis, Maximus also has an eternal ill-being that the damned experience, which we will not be discussing in this video. For our main focus today is to get a foundational understanding of Maximus's undergirding theme as ordered towards union with God. Now unlike Thomas Aquinas, Maximus did not leave us a well-ordered, easy-to-follow work that allows the reader to quickly navigate the trail of his thinking. Instead, one has to glean from the entire corpus of his works to have a basic understanding of what is and is not being posited by the angelic saint. Reading his work is a lot like looking for puzzle pieces scattered throughout his books. It's easy to cherry pick this angelic saint, but I've quickly learned from reading him that cherry picking is, more often than not, devastating to Maximus's points. With that being said, let us proceed with breaking down Maximus's triad of being. The first mode of being on Maximus's tier is what is simply called being. Being for Maximus is used in an Aristotelian context. As such, being is simply that which is, and which stands in opposition to non-being, since non-being was prior to it. For Maximus, like Aquinas, all creatures of being have intrinsic principles that make them to be in a certain way, exclude them from being in other ways. Maximus, following the Septuagint translation of the Bible, refers to being as, quote, works that God began to do. This idea can be found in the second chapter of Genesis according to the LXX translation, where it says as follows, quote, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it God rested from all the works which he had begun to do. Close quote. Begun implies that something is coming into being with non-being prior to it. Thus, for Maximus, Participant being is a type of motion that began and is tending towards rest by the providential care of God. Since God has, in a sense, began this work of being by going outside of himself, then being is circumscribed by motion, time, succession, and passions. For motion, time, and passion are not eternal works of God but they have begun to be in creatures, hence God going outside of himself. This mode of being is a kind of procession from the divine mind ad extra, like an external speech flowing out and away from the divine mind and is tending back towards it to find its context and meaning. I'll talk more about this in an upcoming video. But for now, let's go on to the next tier of well-being. For Maximus, well-being denotes a kind of movement, but one that isn't just natural towards a multiplicity of proximate ends, but is a tending towards the final end, who is also the beginning. Let me break this down. For Maximus, following St. Dionysius, Everything that has being outside of God, and is in time and motion, is preceded by an exemplar, or word, or logoi, pre-existing in the logos. 
that means that whatever is is that means that whatever is is from grounded in and ordered towards the logos of being from which it came down when created well-being then is a willing movement towards the logoi or the thought will from which it was created it's an impulse or affection towards the beloved through the creative virtues which take their seat in the soul of the human person. That virtue is a created likeness of the divine energies can be seen scattered all throughout Maximus's works. For instance, in Maximus's Ambigua, Volume 2, he states as follows when asked about how God can be called at one time love and at another time lovable. Quote, The divine is moved as love and desire, to the extent that he creates an inner condition of desire and love in beings. Close quotes. It's important for Maximus that those who are in the middle tier of well-being operate by free choice in a movement with the divine energies. This is a true cooperation of wills in God and man towards theosis. Though it belongs to God that the creature is gaining perfections from, which will blossom out the gift of eternal well-being. In Maximus' answers to Thalassius, he calls faith, love, and even eternal life created through Christ's work. But these works are not created as if non-existent prior to the creature, but rather created as the creature being moved in accords with Christ's life and power. Elsewhere, in Maximus' first ambiguo, where he reflects upon Moses and Elijah, Maximus makes a clear distinction between an intelligible, eternal creation and a sensible creation that is subject to change. This intelligible, eternal creation is signified by Elijah, who is never given a genealogy of beginning in sacred scripture, while the sensible creation is signified by Moses, who gives out laws of death which govern it and goad it upwards to a greater mode of being. I don't think it is incorrect to say Maximus sees Moses as representing those who have being in the first tier as such, and Elijah as representing of a movement towards an arrival to eternal well-being. These movements up the hierarchy of being can be conceived of as different graces given to the creature. For that, even being itself as a grace is attested to from St. Maximus's works. Thus, even the first tier is a grace. But it is eternal well-being where Maximus gives a special place to grace as arriving to the face-to-face -face encounter with God. Remember that for Maximus, there are two works of God. The first being works which God did not, quote, begin to do, and the other being works that God began to do. When the works that began arrives to the Logos, then is fulfilled the words of Scripture, and God rested from the works that he began to do. Now Maximus is clear that the works that God began to do have non-being as prior to them. On the other hand, the works that God did not begin to do do not have non-being prior to them, and thus these works are eternal. When the creature that began in being is assimilated to the works that are eternal, then the creature's natural motion is said to cease. It has reached its rest. It is an eternal well-being where Maximus says the creature is, quote, elevated beyond nature and time, close quote. It is in this elevation where the creature is wrapped up above all creatures to God and transposed into a state of deification beyond all time, place, and passions. Maximus analogizes this deification as the eighth day of the resurrection compared to the seventh day when Christ was in the tomb. Essentially, the seventh day of begun rest 
is when the intellect begins to see Christ's presence in the essence of all things. And the eighth day is when the logoi, from which the essences are patterned after, are seen face to face. It is this eternal well-being where the creature not only goes beyond all creatures, but even arrives to the first principle of knowledge from which all things come. This state of being, unlike the other two, Maximus says, is entirely by grace. In his Ambigua Volume 2, he states as follows, quote, Eternal being absolutely does not exist as a natural potential within beings, nor does it follow by necessity of free choice. Close quote. Eternal well-being is the abode of those who have passed beyond themselves and all things and have come to rest in God and his participable goodness. From this participation, the creature becomes deified and takes on the qualities of impassibility, immutability, infinity, and whatever else is predicated of God substantively. Having broken down the three tiers of being, which isn't really tiers except by analogy, let us now summarize the thoughts of Maximus while reflecting upon an example given by him in his second ambigua. The first tier in the triad is being. This tier is signified by the Passover as held in Egypt, where Egypt allegorically means the world in which we are born and receive motion and are bound by time consisting of before and afters. Here, Moses is the leader of the camp, even as time measures motion and all moves according to laws and principles within the natures. The second tier is well-being, where the soul, as if separated from the world by its journey towards God, begins to wander through the desert to celebrate the second Passover. This tier of being is where the will is being conformed to the divine movement, intending towards its inheritance in the promised land. And the last Passover is that of the entrance into the promised land, where we eat the good things of the land. This is the eternal abode where the true Sabbath was made for man, and not the man for the Sabbath. It is this abode of which Christ says it was, quote, prepared before the foundations of the world. Here, Moses being time, cannot enter bodily, and yet the principles in which motion operates is not destroyed. Here ushers in what St. Maximus calls beyond the eons. For Maximus, the eon is the eastern equivalent of the western concept of avum. In short, the eon is the eternity of created beings who participate in God's eternity and is believed in the West to be the experience of the angels. It is sometimes called a intermediary state between ordinary time and the divine eternity. Maximus sees the eon as most present in the story of Moses and Joshua. Moses ending his life exemplifies time coming to an end. And Joshua, or Yeshua, Jesus, takes the people to their rest, signifies the eon being ushered in, and then a passing beyond unto the source of eon and time. For Jesus, unlike Moses, takes us to the eternal abode where we come to see God face to face. This is why Joshua was able to make the moon and the sun stand still in his battle against the enemies of Israel. The eon, or avum, is already present imperfectly as we approach our eternal abode, who is God. I have a lot more to say about this particular place, and perhaps I'll make another video in the future giving greater analysis of them. Suffice it to say that the eon and the avum begin, but not in time, such that succession is not experienced there. All we need to consider is how this fits into Maximus' three-tier mode of being. Since he isn't entirely clear, 
it seems that the eons are the intelligible creations in which the material creation is within. So the material creation is said to have a beginning in time, but the eon is said to have a beginning, but not in time. Lord willing, there will be more to come on this in a future video of the eschaton. But for now, let's change gears and turn our attention towards Aquinas' three modes of light. And then afterwards we'll close up this video with some food for thought. Unlike the angelic saint from the East, St. Thomas has a very systematic and easy to follow theology that is centered around the triad of light. This triad begins in reason, is moved to God in faith, and is consummated and rests with God in vision. The whole Christian life is ordered towards the words of our Lord and his high priestly prayer. Quote, this is eternal life, that they may know you as the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Close quote. Now, contrary to what many say, Thomas actually has a very robust cosmic scope picture of the eschaton. He speaks of the resurrection of the body, the restoration of the cosmic order, and an entire assimilation to Christ's glorified human nature. However, for Thomas, the good news is not just a simple return to the Adamic state, but something beyond what Adam had gifted to him, had gifted to him in the Garden of Paradise, namely, the sight of God. For Christ did not come just so that we might once again have life, as Adam did in the Garden, but rather have it more abundantly. And again, Christ didn't just raise man from the dead to return to his pre-fall state, but rather he ascended man to where he was not prior to the fall. For the gospel isn't just the return unto paradise, but rather the gospel is an invitation into the very inner Trinitarian life. The object of the eternal son's happiness is extended to the creature to be seen. Herein is the grace above all grace, namely, the grace to see what eye has not seen, nor ear heard from the foundation of the world. For Aquinas, everything else is background to this grace, which is infinitely above all cosmic restoration. With that being said, let us go on to discuss briefly St. Thomas's triad of light. St. Thomas Aquinas, following St. Augustine, discusses three progressions of light in the Christian ascent to God. These lights should not be thought of as three tiers such that one tier is wholly distinct from the other, but rather the one intellect, which is the subject of the progressive lights, is being moved towards the vision of God by a greater precision at each ascent, until at last it reaches its greatest perfection. Not unlike Maximus, Aquinas begins at the most fundamental with what is actually called being in regard to the intellect namely, the light of reason. Now when we say light, we are not referring to that which was created when God said, be light made, but rather, what the light that is made is to the human eyes, that reason is to the intellect. Without going into the metaphysical baggage, we can simply say that light in the intellect is simply intellectual knowledge, which rational creatures participate in. It is because of this light that man is set apart from the animals, and in motion towards the sight of God. Like Maximus, Aquinas has a motion to rest paradigm, and thus the intellect's motion is ordered towards God as its end. Aquinas eloquently calls this light the, quote, reflected gleam of divine clarity in the soul, close quote. It is by this light that all Mankind can observe that God exists vis-a-vis -vis the created order and perfections laced throughout it. In fact, it's the Catholic position that other faiths have elements of truth because they have the light of reason, which is not able to pierce to the articles of faith, but is able to know that God is. 
Speaking of this topic, I'm slightly tempted to veer off into disproving those who ridicule natural theology and ecumenism by the words of St. Maximus, but I'll restrain for the time being. The next light we'll briefly discuss is what's called the light of faith, or sometimes referred to as the light of grace. This light does not put reason to an end, but rather elevates it, fortifying it to turn the gaze from seeing God in creation to seeing God in himself. That God as he is in himself is the object of faith is proved from sacred scripture. For those who have faith no longer walk by sight, and also have present the, quote, substance of what's hoped for, close quote. Not that sight ceases in the external eyes, but rather the intellect is no longer depending on sight as its sole confidant by which to know God. That is, it's no longer abstracting from sense data. For faith is a virtue super added to the intellect by God himself, as a motion towards him as he is ad intra and not ad extra. This light does not precede grace any more than the eyes of reason precedes birth. For even as someone who is not cannot see, let me say that again, for even as someone who is not cannot see, so one who is not born from above cannot tend towards God as an object to be loved. Thus faith which comes through Jesus Christ is consequent to grace. Those who had the gift of faith have been reaped out of the world by a super added light, which other religions and non-believers cannot believe with hope. Now the last light in Thomas' system is what is called the light of glory. This light is the end of the light of faith reaching its consummation and places God himself as immediately and intuitively present to the interior eyes of the faithful. In this light, the intellect is wrapped above all intellection and attains to its rest which it, know, which it longs for by the gift of charity and hope. In this light, charity blossoms into fruition and hope gives way to possession. This light is the very light whereby the intellect attains to the sight of the divine essence. No longer is the imagination forming images by negation and affirmation, but rather the intellect is fully satiated in the incomprehensible communion of the Trinity by God's utter self-donation to the rational creature. God holds nothing back from the rational creature in this wedding of the divine logos to the soul. It is from this sight that everything else flows out of and redounds down into the body. I will leave the discussion of the light of glory here for this video. If anyone wants to take a deeper look into this light, then the listener is welcome to check out my video on the beatific vision. But for now, let's go on to some closing thoughts. And though I did uh, intend to give my own personal synthesis of Aquinas and Maximus, I'll save that for another video. In this video, we have taken a deep dive into St. Maximus' thoughts in regards to the three tiers of being. We also considered Aquinas and how his threefold distinction of light is analogous to Maximus' thoughts. If one compares the two with a good spirit, then I believe they'll come to the same conclusion as I. Namely, Aquinas and Maximus are not just angelic minds in their own domain of followers but rather each is where the other is at. For in Christ there is no east or west, but rather one holy, catholic, and orthodox church with an apostolic foundation. To Christ be the praise and the glory forever and ever. Thank you all for watching this episode of Mount Athos and Aquinas Fellowship. Stay tuned for more upcoming content, and until then, God bless.